I'm Claire and welcome to my channel. So today's video is all about fragrance regulation. So IFRA are the body that regulate fragrance production and actually they do ban certain chemicals that were previously included in fragrances for reasons of safety or even precaution and they also do limit certain materials in fragrances and I just really want to discuss what have been the major bans and how has that affected fragrances, what have they used as replacements, what have different companies done and I also just want to talk about some fragrance ingredients that are limited in formulations. This isn't meant to be sensationalist or alarmist, it's just for information. Actually a viewer asked me to do this video quite a long time ago and I thought to myself I really need to do a lot of reading to, to make this video because I don't want to say anything that isn't accurate. So hopefully this is all completely okay but if anybody knows better, then please do let me know in the comments. So if you haven't seen me before, I'm Claire Smith. I'm actually a scientist in real life. And so I do my best with these kinds of things, but I'm not a perfumer. But I make content all about perfume history, perfume science. And I also just do some straight perfume reviews and also fun perfume tags. So if that kind of thing interests you and you haven't already subscribed, then please do consider subscribing. And if you like this kind of content, then please do press the like button as well. So let's start off with the basics. What is IFRA? So IFRA stands for the International Fragrance Association. And actually this is a global conglomerate body. There are different branches in different countries under different names, but ultimately it's known worldwide as IFRA. IFRA are essentially a trade body and they aim to represent the fragrance industry. So they really represent the major manufacturers of perfume. So firms like Fermaniche, Simrise, Takasago, Givaudin, Rubate, really big fragrance and flavour molecule makers like those brands. So those companies are the companies that are employed by fragrance conglomerate brands. So people like Estee Lauder, L'Oreal, um, you know, when they want to make a fragrance, they will approach those brands to formulate it. So companies manufacturing fragrances can choose to be IFRA compliant or not IFRA compliant. But really the major benefit of being IFRA compliant is that most of the time you are going to hit the country standards where you are selling. There might be a few exceptions, but for the most part, IFRA is normally as strict or sometimes stricter than the regulations. The one exception to that normally is the EU. The EU actually legislate quite harshly compared with the rest of the world. So if you're a European customer of fragrance, I think you're pretty safe because the EU are really on it. You may notice when you buy a fragrance that it's not a complete list of ingredients. It will say some chemicals and then it will say something like parfum. And that's because companies don't have to list every single ingredient. They just have to list particular ingredients that are controlled in some ways. So they might have been found to be very mildly allergenic in some way, or they might be sun sensitizers. Those kinds of ingredients will be listed on a fragrance box, but other ingredients that don't have any associated risks with them won't be listed. They'll just be grouped in with this category called Puffum. And that's to one, protect the formula, but also just a safe space on a box. You can imagine how many different ingredients there are in a fragrance. The list would be very, very long. So next, what is the process by which IFRA talk to fragrance companies? So IFRA generally hold a consultation process every few years and they talk with the industry and they really present to them evidence that they might have found that something might be allergenic or have some other risk associated with it. So really the main risks would be things like genotoxicity, so something that might mutate DNA, or something perhaps that is reprotoxic, so something that is maybe not great for fertility. And they will then consult the industry on this and say, you know, how important is this ingredient? How widely is this used? You know, what kind of time frame are we looking at to, to get rid of it? Can we look into finding alternatives? And the industry will get going, basically. They will try and find alternatives very quickly because once that consultation happens, they kind of know it's maybe not set in stone, but it's a possibility that it could happen in future. And really, companies are always looking at the bottom line. So they're always going to reformulate an ear on the side of caution rather than wait for a change to come in. 
So after a consultation process, IFRA will issue something called an amendment, and that's really a change in the regulations. So currently we're on the 52nd IFRA amendment, bearing in mind that IFRA has been going since 1973. And each amendment is an opportunity for IFRA to either ban or restrict the use of particular aroma chemicals. So as part of the amendment, IFRA will give notice to the industry and they will say, right, for the existing fragrances, you've got until so-and-so a date to reformulate or discontinue. And then for new fragrances on the market, you've got a, a, a shorter date. You've got less time because we want everything that's on the market to be compliant with this amendment. This notice period will be given and then obviously it will enact. And by that time, anybody who wants to be said to be IFRA compliant has to comply with that new amendment. Of course, IFRA rule changes sometimes coincide with local law changes. So the EU, as I've said, is quite hot on changing the law around what can and can't be in cosmetics. The FDA in the US slightly less so, but they still are quite reactive and IFRA consult with both bodies, I think. So next, what have been the major bans and restrictions that have really come up in fragrance history? Which ones have had the biggest impact on the fragrance industry as a whole? So as I've said, IFRA has been going since 1973, so I'm not going to detail every single ban and every single substance. I'm just going to pick out some major ones. So thing that really pops into my head about controls by IFRA is really something that was called the oak moss crisis. And that really had a big effect on the perfume industry. Lots of fragrances had to be reformulated or even discontinued. And it really affected vintage fragrances, probably most of all, because it included an ingredient that was fundamental to Shepa formulas and also to Fougere formulas. So Shepras are fragrances with citrus top notes and then with woody bases that often include oak moss as a key ingredient. So if you're wondering what oak moss actually looks like, here's some that I picked up when I went to Germany. I just found it on a forest floor. In Germany, it was growing all over the forest. It, was, it really grows on oak trees, surprisingly, on the bark, and then it falls off onto the floor. It's very distinctive to look at and you've probably seen it if you've walked around a northern European forest or if you've walked around a North American forest. It's something that's really very easy to find. So when I refer to cheaper fragrances, which fragrances am I actually referring to? So I'm thinking about things like Clinique's Aromatics Elixir, Chanel number no. 5 is another classic example, Chanel number no. 19, Golan's Mitsuku, also things not traditionally in the Shepa genre, so things like CK1, for example, or Ralph Lauren's Romance. Fundamentally, oak moss was not included in fragrances purely for its smell. It was also used as a fixative. It was something that really melded fragrances with skin and really just made them stay there for a long time. So fragrance companies needed to find something else to give fragrances longevity. So IFRA were way ahead of the game with restrictions on oak moss and they put them in as early as the 2000s, whereas it wasn't actually put into legislation in, in various countries around the world until sort of the late 2010s, really. But IFRA actually put in a really strict limit in 2009. So in 2009, they limited the amount of oak moss that could be in a formula to 0.1% and the amount of atranol and chlorotranol that could be in the oak moss extract at 100 parts per million. So they were really trying to guard against this allergen being in any quantity in fragrances from as early as 2009. By the time the EU decided they really wanted to ban oak moss completely, the EU realised that IFRA's limit was really quite strict already. And they said that any IFRA compliant fragrance would be absolutely fine with them because the limit was already pretty low. So anybody already adopting IFRA standards was not affected by the EU legislation, which was enacted in 2019, but anybody who wasn't following those standards clearly had to either adopt IFRA standards or completely remove oak moss from their formulations. It was industry lobbying that really prevented a complete ban and allowed those IFRA rules to continue to be acceptable to the EU. But what was it about atronol and chloroatronol that meant that the EU and IFRA didn't want them in fragrances? Well, both of those components of oak moss are considered to be allergens. And actually studies have proposed that up to 3% of Europeans might be sensitive to those chemicals. 
And really sensitivity could be something as simple as redness, a skin rash or itching. So what were some companies doing to get around this issue? Well, really, some companies were taking natural oak moss extracts and fractionating them and removing the offending chloroatronol and atronol from the oak moss extract. So they basically got all of the, the smell, the fixative properties, but without the offending components. That to me sounds like a really sensible, if potentially expensive solution to this. Other brands started to use synthetic alternatives to oak moss. So the most famous of these is a molecule called Evanile. Other brands discontinued or reformulated fragrances to reduce or avoid oak moss. So oak moss presents a really interesting dilemma because some people might argue that oak moss is only classed as a potential allergen. It's not something that is potentially going to affect your fertility or something that is going to be harmful to your your DNA, something that's not mutagenic. So really, it could be something as simple as just slapping a label on a perfume bottle and saying, if you're sensitive to oak moss, you should avoid this fragrance. Of course, lots of people don't know they're sensitive to oak moss until they've tried something with oak moss and they get a skin reaction. But, you know, that would be an alternative to just removing the substance from perfumes, wouldn't it? That would be a viable alternative. But I guess the EU takes a harsher line than that. So some other important restrictions, in fact, bans, were to do with aroma chemicals mimicking the smell of Lily the Valley. One such chemical was called Lyral, and you might have seen this labelled as HICC as well. It was used not only to make Lily of the Valley notes, but also to make other white florals and to just add a general floral feel to fragrances. Lyral was banned by the EU in 2021 and it was restricted by IFRA in the rest of the world to 0.2%. Lyral, like the oak moss components, was found to be allergenic. So you might not be familiar with the name Lyral, but actually Lyral is the thing that gives Creed's Aventus or did give Creed's Aventus that subtle floral touch. It's also thought to have been used in Chanel's Coco and Dior's Dune, but it's likely to have been used in many other fragrances. Lyral is described as having a very gentle Lily of the Valley impression and even having elements of cyclamen and soft lilac. It's described as smooth, slightly dewy and having a slightly green touch to it. It's also said to give a silky kind of halo to other floral notes such as jasmine, rose and peony. A second aroma chemical used in much the same way as Lyral, called Lilial, was also banned by the UK and the EU in 2022. Technically, IFRA compliant fragrances shouldn't contain this chemical because IFRA have now banned it as well. But the US's FDA have not regulated against its use in other products. So in the US, it's possible that you might still find some fragrance products with Lilial in them. Lilial was banned because it was designated to potentially be reprotoxic. That means it potentially negatively affects your fertility. The ban on Lilial really affected the fragrance industry and really there was no one perfect direct replacement, but often fluorol was used in combination with other chemicals, depending upon the context of the fragrance. So because of the ban on Lilial, lots of fragrances had to be reformulated that used it. So fragrances such as Lancome's Hypnose, YSL's Cinema, Dior's Diorissimo, Givenchy's Amarige, Angel Dumont, and also Isatis, as well as Cacherelle's Anaïs Anaïs, and also Amour Amour. Even Mugler's Alien and even Paco Rabanne's Lady Million were affected. And a Fragrantica article even claims that Moschino and also Versace had to reformulate their entire catalogue of fragrances. So you've heard about three major amendments affecting the fragrance industry, but of course not all amendments result in serious bans or controls. They just reflect changes in regulation. And so let's look at the more recent amendments and what they've said. So the 50th amendment banned only one chemical and that was called mint lactone. This apparently had a profile of sweet, creamy, coumarin and coconut, even tobacco nuances, as well as spearmint. I don't know where this was used. I don't know any fragrances this was in. I've tried to research it, 
but I cannot find anything that specifically states that this was used in that fragrance. Currently, we are right in the middle of the enactment of the 51st Amendment. So the 51st Amendment will be complete for fragrances already on the market at the end of October this year. And that amendment banned a chemical called 3-acetyl-2,5-methylfuran. So that chemical was used to create sweet, warm, caramel-like notes in fragrances. It has sweet, nutty and earthy undertones, meaning that it was used to create chocolate, nuts and caramel and coffee kind of smells. This particular chemical was banned because it was found to have genotoxic effects. It's important to say here that this chemical is actually naturally occurring. You can find it in grapes, you can find it in chocolate and you can find it in coffee. So, you know, this isn't a case of synthetics, bad, natural, good. Far from it. You know, both natural and synthetic aroma chemicals are regulated in exactly the same way and both can be potentially dangerous. It's clear that many naturally occurring aroma chemicals are actually really tightly controlled and a lot of them do have limits even if they aren't themselves banned. For example, you know, when people pick up a vintage Sheepa fragrance, sometimes the bergamot oil used in those fragrances is at such a high concentration that people spray it on their, on their skin and then they go out into the sun. And of course, citrus oils are things that can really encourage your skin to burn in the sunshine. And there are cases of people buying vintage fragrances and then spraying them on, going out in the sun and then getting quite badly burnt. And that's just because people aren't used to those kinds of effects with modern fragrances. It's just not a thing as much because those components are controlled in fragrances now, whereas at one time they weren't controlled. So naturally occurring aroma chemicals such as eugenol, citral and also cumarin have limits in fragrances as do things like natural jasmine extracts, jasmine grandiflorum and also jasmine sandback. On occasions these limits are kind of academic because often for example with jasmine oil really the concentrations are so high above what is used in modern fragrances that those limits would never actually be reached but they are there in on paper. So that's completely up to date now. We're right in the middle of the consultation period for the 52nd Amendment. We should hear about what the publication says in 2026 and then the changes should be enacted at some point in 2027 or 2028. I actually think that it's really positive that IFRA exists and that there are such strict regulations around fragrance. If I'm not going to be given a complete ingredients list for my fragrance when I'm putting something on my skin. In fact, anything I'm putting on my skin, you know, shower gel or it's something I'm breathing in like cleaning products or I'm eating in my food. I want regulatory bodies to be hot on those topics. I do not want to ingest things that are going to potentially harm me, including allergens. But I appreciate that other people might just want some labelling for allergens. Of course, there are other effects from chemicals that we probably just want to outright control or ban. But as with everything in life, as Paracelsus says, the dose makes the poison. It's not necessarily the chemical itself, it's the exposure level at which you get something as to whether it has a good or a harmful effect. So thank you so much for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, then please do press the like button and please also consider subscribing if you haven't done already. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.